Wow. Um, that We're here like, in part because of you, <laughs> that, that, Matt. Really? Is it, why, yeah. why, why is this my fault? Introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Honan. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a reporter and an editor. Doug, uh, Doug, you're the director of the movie. Justin, you're the... Uh, Subjects, and I think I think all of us were online in the '90s. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about this movie is how different things turned out than I think we all thought they were going to be in 1996. And I'm wondering if maybe you guys could start off by talking a little bit about um, how what you thought things were going to look like in '96 when this movie was being filmed um, are today. Well, I think watching it now, and thank you guys for sitting through that, is, um, is, uh, is the sense that this is the moment before search engines, really. I mean, that, that interview at the start of the film where the woman's like, oh, yeah, you know, you kind of can't find anything unless you get a link or whatever. What's that? It's remarkable, yeah. It's remarkable, right? Because the two things that have changed the most is now you can search the internet, and now we all have the internet in our pockets, which is like totally bananas, like in terms of bringing all this intimacy like into our immediacy. I'm actually curious about something. If you were a sophomore, or, you know, in college, Let's now, your mic's off, given, yep. close given, to your face. Okay. Given that uh, the, the changes that have happened, I mean, would you be, you know, tweeting away like mad, doing going wild? Look, on if Facebook? I if I had a compulsive need for attention, and I was in college, and I was a young person with fewer boundaries and relationships, I would definitely be doing something. I mean, I'd probably be on Fortnite dancing my face off, or like, you know, I mean. The mediums emerge, right? People find new fields to seed and plow and water and all that stuff. Right? I, I just I, I mean, my I'm, timing was. I'm, know, I'm curious. I'm curious if it felt uh, like if you felt like there weren't a lot of consequences to what you were doing back then. Like like when you talk about uh, search engines and 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 uh, one of the things that search engines enabled. We talked a little bit on the phone. Is that uh, if if I were somehow involved in your life at Swarthmore. And you mentioned me online, like nobody's going to see that in 1996. But in by by 2000, Google exists and is and is a very powerful thing. And I might enter my name and see, and some or someone else might enter my name. Someone who's like looking at me to maybe hire me or not hire me and sees me on your website. And can you talk a little bit about that and how that changed how you thought about publishing? Matt, you put your finger on it. I mean, it, this is somewhat cringeworthy uh, for me to watch because aside from my friend Carew, who actually came out, uh, who was implicated in some of the drama here, that, um, the, the, you know, uh, I, I feel now I would not do those things to those people in terms of uh, revealing my boner-twitching adventures, you know, in, in shared circumstance with real names. Uh, it's just, um, uh, it seems so liberated at the time, and now I'm like, oh, I... I took responsibility for someone else's story, and I think there's an irresponsibility to that. If the person's not a public figure, then then you you know you are you are are taking a great responsibility to tell intimate stories about someone else that may let land them, that may identify them with behaviors that they're not ready to accept. And at the time, I thought this is a tool of liberation. We shall all unburden ourselves of secrets using the internet. Um, now, of course, people will do that for you by hacking your identity or by, you know, sort of digging up your details and doxing you or something. But really, I was doxing my friends at the time, and that's like a, I think, ultimately a path to sadness in terms of human relationships. I, I'm moving away from your question. Did, did, did you think it would be permanent? Like, did you, did you think the stuff that you were publishing in 1996, 1998, 1999 would be here 20 years later? Oh, man, Matt, that, you know, I really thought at the time that, like, oh, we got to put everything on the web so it'll be around forever. Because somehow it didn't occur to me that when you turn off the, the electricity, like all the information goes away. I somehow thought that this, we were creating like the, the library of Alexandria that will never burn, uh, which is not the case. Uh, you know, and maybe fortunately, it's weird to think of that because I thought we should keep all this stuff for all time. One of the leading things is I thought I would want to read like my grandmother's personal diary about her situation, but, you know, I don't think she'd want me to. I don't know. Doug, your, your movie is very optimistic, um, even as it's very sad, but it's very optimistic, and, and I, I wonder if, uh, if, if the optimism that I think you felt at the time has, has been tempered? You know, I, I mixed feelings. I, is my mic on loud enough? I, no. Okay. Thank you. You have a voice that carries better than mine. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, 
it was really an interesting experience to go into this because I was just really eager to explore this new thing called the internet that I knew very little about, but just sensed that it was gonna impact everything about the way we communicate with each other uh, and all that, but I kind of went into it with this very open mind about it, and um, it was, you know, fascinating to me to um, kind of fall under the spell of Justin, you know, and what he was trying to do, because um, I thought it was remarkable. I mean, I thought it was completely idealistic, uh, this idea that, um, uh, you know, and brave, I thought, to just put himself out there in this very unfiltered way. And if he wasn't such a talented writer, it would have been awful. <laughs> but he really could write. Um, and as you can see by the way he talks, I mean, he, you know, he's really, he was just really special. And, um, and it inspired me to go on and do my own blog, which I do not recommend if you're like doing it while making a film. Like, it's very exhausting. Um, and what happened was, I, you know, in following him through this trail and meeting all these other people and kind of linking outward from there, um, I got really, uh, I, I, I was really impressed with Howard and what he was trying to do with community. I mean, yes, it didn't quite work out entrepreneurially, um, but I just thought there's something to me, that was where I saw sort of the sweet spot of the internet and what its potential could be. Uh, I just didn't think it was necessarily in blogs, at least as far as I was concerned, because it's just like I wasn't ready to put the kind of energy and open myself up quite the same way, you know, and I kind of focused on the making of the film those three years. And as soon as the film went on to, um, HBO. I, I had a hard time writing about its distribution phase because it's hard to be really honest about all the assholes out there in distribution land. Um, and so uh, I had a conversation with a friend one day around that time, uh, Dan Richards, who was a friend of Howard's and was into virtual communities. And I said something like, oh, documentary filmmakers would make a great virtual community. You know, we, we work in isolation. Even in New York, I feel very isolated from this community. And they're really great people who are very idealistic themselves. And what a great way to share our common knowledge and support each other and network and all that sort of stuff. And so the D word became transformed into this virtual community overnight. You know, we released out um, from Howard the first year. We leased out um, one of his little side rooms or something. Um, anyway, we're celebrating its 20th year this year. And um, we now have almost 17,000 members from 130 countries. And like every day, we just have this like incredibly vibrant conversation going on there. And um, Would that have happened without the movie? Would that have happened without the movie? Oh, God, no. That would never have happened without, without the movie. Um, and so, um, you know, I th that's, you know, to me, the, where the, ideal, the early idealism still holds up. I mean, it's very depressing, too, now, to go on and just see people trolling each other in comments. I mean, you can't read a newspaper article and see the comments without people going at each other. And that's truly depressing. If, if I can like ask us something about the, 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 the depressing stuff, which is like what I'm interested in. Um, uh, <clears throat> when I watch this movie, it's, it's like such a great snapshot of the time, but it's also a snapshot of like elites, mostly white people, mostly white guys, uh, creating the early internet. And I, and I wonder if, if when you look at it now, if some of the things that we're seeing that are, that are Big systematic problems with the internet. If 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 you if you look at this if you look at this through your eyes today, if you see like if maybe we'd had, if maybe we were thinking about a more universal internet at the time, if things would have been better, or how you think about it now when you look back on those days, and think about being someone who was young and idealistic, uh, and building this new thing. If if you could have brought more people into it, how you, how would you have done that? Well, I mean. 
literally I got on a Greyhound bus and traveled across America to try to make the internet less like me because I was a privileged white guy from, a, you know, going to college. And at that, I mean, I remember the when I first got on the internet, I got access through my buddy who was at college, and then I tried to get an internet account, and there was no commercial internet service providers until, like, 1993, 1994, 1995. Literally, the only way to get on the internet was to work for a defense contractor or to be going to college. And so that was a very tight little pen for the internet to be, you know, feeding in. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I worked hard by taking the bus and going to cafes and churches and schools and mental institutions and saying, like, hey, let's get, let's get, get people on the web. Not me, somebody else. Let's see, I want to learn about you because it looks a lot like me right now. Let's get some other people in there. It's a, it's a heavy slog because, I mean, you got two web nerds in this film who can't even afford a second computer in the mid-90s. What are you going to do with, you know, people who are, like, in a housing project trying to get on the computer in 1996? Not a lot. It was tough. So, uh, you know, I tried hand-to-hand -hand stuff, and then I wasn't, like, sophisticated enough to think systemically about, you know, sort of the educational system or, like, interventions, and I don't know what. I mean, I was some 19-year-old, and I was like, I'm going to be super honest about who I am and, like, my, like, little slice of privilege that got me to this spot. Here's a and picture of me naked. Yeah, yeah exactly. here's a picture of me naked. Like, there's, I didn't turn around and open my cheeks, but everything else was out there, you know? And, like, I think... Uh, you know, I tried to be upfront and I tried to fix it, but it was it's a big systemic situation. I think uh, you know, Carl, who is also was in the audience. I saw him go to the bathroom. I don't know if he returned. Oh, oh yes he is. Where are you? Hey, Carl. You, I thought you were so articulate. You've always been articulate. Um, and maybe this mic is yours, which is why it's silent. But this is um, uh, basically thank you. Uh, basically, uh, as he said, it's like we thought it would be something different, but when you get in there, humans are just kind of laying into each other. And my, my hope, Matt, is that what's happening is it's going to be like another 20, 30 years, and then we'll all figure out how to be polite on the web, and then because we'll have invented like a telepathy where we sa savage each other. But we'll be on the web, we'll be polite, and then, you know. I think the politeness ship has sailed. Uh, <laughs> I may be wrong. Uh, one of the things that uh, we touched on this earlier, we're talking about Google, but uh, when this movie's made, everybody's like, making stuff for other people to come and see. Like, like the other people have to come and see it. Like, come see it. I'm, I'm going to make this thing. I'm going to put it out there. I have no idea if anybody's going to see it or not. And we've, we've moved from that to a world that's f largely feed-driven, right? Like, like, we, like you open Twitter, you open Facebook, you open whatever your, your, your thing is, and you just kind of scroll through the feed of, of, of people doing stuff that's all run by a usually a large company here in California. Um, and I, I wonder if you have thoughts about how uh, the like seeking versus feed delivery system has changed the internet, either or both of you. I'd love to hear, I, Doug, I'd love to hear you on this too. Uh, I don't know, you know, I'm probably not the best one to talk about that, but uh, you probably are, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think all you need to know, oh, thank you. All, all you need to know about Matt is his Twitter feed is at Matt. Um, <laughs> um, so I would turn that question around to you. What, what, you're the expert on that. Yeah, but I was trying to fade in the background of this stuff still. So, so Justin, let's, <laughs> no let's, let's But no, I mean, I, I do think it's changed. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I think that the uh, the idea of seeking versus like having kind of having constant entertainment has turned it from a like a uh, a place where people are seeking stuff out to a place where you just sort of expect to have entertainment and 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 sometimes provocative stuff delivered to you, which allows people who who want to uh, who want to exploit provocative things uh, do that on platforms in a way that that, that we haven't really fully understood what that's going to mean yet, but Justin, we're, we're here not for me, but for, but for you guys, so, so feeds versus seeking? Well, I think, um, I you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and it's like when you first got on the web in 1990-whatever, somebody had to give you an address to go to, or you would end up on the homepage of the browser, but then everywhere you went, you went because y you got connected there. So it's literally like a handshake, like a pass along, like an introduction. So that's a, that's a very different way to surf the web. Can you imagine if you encountered the web today and you only went places you could click to? I mean, there's a lot of places to click to, but 
Now you can you can actually do a lot of seeking on the web. You could go to sure, sure, yeah. Yes, yeah. and I and so I think and people seek all day, and people arrange their products so that they get sought and show up in those lists. And then you can feed all day. You can get buzzed on your feed, and you know, and get plugged into all that stuff. And I, I mean, I think they're both out there. But yes, it's lost its sort of collegial like, oh look, you found your way into that corner of the private party sort of feeling, because um, I I. I I got a lot to say on these topics, but I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, I was talking to someone who said, I used to like the web so much more when it was just the people who were really passionate about putting themselves out there, and it all felt like you'd been invited to a more intimate sort of personal affair, and I was like, yes, you could argue that was very cool and interesting and it had a certain feeling to it, but I'm really glad that everybody's online. Like, ultimately, I think it's better. I mean, like, holy shit, I could pull out my phone right now and, like, text, like, like a, someone in Nairobi or like, you know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's truly huge. I mean, I would, I would argue that there are things happening on TikTok that are as intimate as anything that you, that you were doing in the 90s, but, but it's just offset to music. Yeah, it's also, and, and that's a little corner of the web that you wouldn't find your way into unless you were 12 or told by a cool reporter or whatever. Thank you for pointing to your cool reporter. Can I can I ask you? Uh, I want to I want to ask some questions to the audience, but I do want to ask you this because it was something I was wondering about the entire movie. Can you tell me about the structural integrity of your hair in 1996? Okay, um, Matt. Thank you for asking because uh, my hair, the person who cut my hair for like the last 12 years, just retired, or like a year and a half ago, and so I don't have a new hair strategy. And this is what happened the last time I had hair this long. I didn't have a hair strategy, and I, what I do is I, I um, have a habit where I run my hands through my hair and then I like drip, uh, like blonde hairs are falling out of my fingers wherever I'm sitting. And I started to feel really bad about that, so I just stopped brushing my hair with my fingers. And then it started to clump up in the back. And it was uncomfortable to sleep upon, so I lifted it up and when I would go to sleep, I would lift my hair up to go to sleep. And then I was constantly wiping it out of my face, so that made it sort of fuse. And then I just started putting like beads and shit in it, and then... And I would, I wa people would be like, oh, you stopped washing your hair. Not at all. I would massage Dr. Bronner's in there, but the challenge was that it w you could not dry it. So it began to have like a certain mildew smell, and, and I think, and then what I said early in the film is like, people just gave me such weird looks, I had to cut it off. This sounds like a very teenage boy thing. No, no. <laughs> I, I gotta say, it's, I, it's one of my very favorite scenes in the film was Justin putting the clump on his head with the weirdest fucking hairdo in the world going like, people used to give me these strange looks. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I'm gonna, I wanna open up to the audience in a second, but do, uh, tell me, what are some of the things that, that either of you have put on the web that you wish that you hadn't? And, and like both, I require an answer from both of you here. Well, you first, Doug. Uh, I can't think of any because I'm very careful about what I put up. Nothing. There's nothing. You've, you've never put anything you've regretted on the online. I do not believe this. Uh, when I was blogging, I, I took real care. I mean, like, I carefully wrote and edited and, like, looked it over and over and over again with kind of this long view that someday in the future someone's going to go back and read this. Um, and then, of course, you know, blogs, I mean, long before... Um, they actually fell out of, I, I, I was out of it in, I, what, 99. But, you know, blogs, I mean, it's really interesting. Um, you know, to talk to some real um, popular bloggers about five, six years ago saying the days of the blogs are over. I mean, nobody, it's all about the water cooler and the, you know, Twitter and what's, you know, 140 feeds, characters. Man. Yeah. And feeds, man. What's the latest? Yeah. You know, people don't even want to go back in their Twitter feed more than an hour. So are they really going to go back and look at old blog entries? And you know, people just don't have the time or the patience. Um, but you know, I think I'm just a bit of perfectionist. It's probably why I'm drawn to filmmaking. Is you know, you sit there and you go over all the footage, and you work with a really good editor, and you, you know, think very, very carefully and deliberately about every single cut in the movie, and you know, you spend. You spend um, a lot of time nitpicking over like a frame here, or let it go a couple frames there, or the music isn't quite right. You know, it's it's also that 20 years later when you show it to an audience, you're not, you know, p 
pissed off at yourself for compromising at some point or taking a shortcut, and you can sit there and be proud of you know, what you were trying to do. There is stuff that I put on the internet yesterday that I regret, or in the day before, <laughs> and like, in like, pick a day. Justin, have you ever regretted anything you put on the internet? Well, it's so interesting because I watch this film and I'm like, I regret putting a picture of Denise on the internet because like, I feel terrible in this movie that I've participated in her objectification or prompted her objectification. But, I mean, she dressed provocatively on campus, so I, would, I created a portrait of her as I saw her on campus, but then it became entwined in this sort of sexualization of a you know, young person on the internet. And so, I mean, to watch this film is to say, ah, gosh, that doesn't feel so great. But then she kind of sort of liked it later. Right, and you pan down to show her skirt, which I guess I'm thankful for. You know, everybody's complicit in the sexualization of other people, but, you know, I would say that um, I, uh, I was in that dorm room portrayed in that film when I got a phone call from someone who had been a dear, a dear person in my life, a very dear person in my life, and I had written, like, a very laudatory portrait of them on my website, and they called me up and they said, I just cannot have this on the web. I'm going into a professional world where I cannot be affiliated with you. And it slayed me. I was like, I, I, you, you got one of the best pages in the whole thing, man. Like, I wrote, I wrote the best stuff about you, and you don't want to be affiliated with me. It's not even like, don't say this or don't say that. It's like, I don't even want to be, like, linked by you. I was like, wow. That hurt, like, that made me feel like, oh, this whole project, like, it, it was the beginning of the end of the whole project because... Like, you asked me what I regret putting on the internet. I stopped this sort of super intimate shit by 2005 in terms of, like, writing about other people. And, uh, I mean, at that time when I stopped, I got... I, the last thing I sort of did was put up a crying video of myself, and there were dudes on the internet yeah, that well, were like... Yeah, tell me about this. The, yeah, the, 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 yeah, people were like, oh, that guy's crying because he had a mental breakdown on the web. Here's his address. Let's go teach that faggot a lesson. And I was like, oh, shit, like... I, I made myself extra vulnerable, and now there are like hooligans who are waiting to punch someone, and I'm like a good looking target. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have put that on the web. But man, that was like 15 years ago. There's so many more punching bags on the internet. I'm like a small, I'm small potatoes. And the stuff I wrote, every, when people asked me to take stuff down, it ended up being taken down. Like, I took stuff down. I feel bad about Denise saying, oh, I told him the photo. I don't like the photo. I didn't take the photo down. I feel terrible. Like, I took so many pages down between 1996 when search started and like, you know, Jesus, like 10 years ago, I was still taking stuff down because I used people's last names. I was like, ah, oh, if I'd only written without people's last names, maybe my webpage would have been more evergreen. But the whole project was just crazy because by the end I'm meeting people and they're either like, don't write about me or they're like, I love that you write about me, please. Like, hey, didn't we do something cool yesterday? Why didn't you write about it? That sucked, that sucked almost worse. Because then it's like, oh wait, what, what's going on here? Who's hanging out with who for what? And what are we doing? And God, I gotta write about it too. One, one um, quote that has really ruled this whole thing for me is a Tallulah Bankhead quote. She said, only the good girls keep diaries. The bad girls never have time. And I was always trying to figure out where I fell on the good girl, bad girl spectrum in terms of <laughs> diary keeping and adventure. But I mean, I did a lot and I wrote about it and I still have friends. So I feel like I don't have a lot of regrets. And I keep saying I keep saying we're going to open up questions. I do want to ask, like, like, which is weirder, which is stranger, the like, early internet homepage culture that you're in, or the like Wild West? Let me, because if I can, you're you're now you are now a cannabis entrepreneur. You're, um, Wild West uh, legalization of, of of like marijuana cannabis culture that that's that's happening right now that you're also a part of. Matt, that was a fabulous plug. Thank you so much. In 1994, welcome, I registered bud.com and sat on it for 25 years and launched a cannabis delivery company, Bud. First Bud, promo code, $10 off for all of you. Special friends, thank you. Um, and I'm now, in, I'm the chief technology officer. I sort of have a, a, a handle on the business operations and uh, that is to say that like my, my angle on the participation in the culture is entirely different. Like 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, I was like, I'm gonna teach people how to participate in this thing. And now I'm like, oh my God, there's this crazy new access to human, human plant intercourse happening and I'm gonna lubricate and facilitate and advance that like from a business and marketing and like, you know, productization platform standpoint. Like just my participation in the thing is entirely different. I will tell you it is the business ride of a lifetime 
because we got illegal competition and government regulations changing every quarter and like massively funded. We're taking on pharma and tobacco and alcohol. We're going for all of them. We're going to replace the glass of beer at the end of the day and we're going to replace the opioids and I mean, we're coming for all of it. It feels great. Yeah, just like the web and in 20 years I'll be on a panel being like, oh man, we didn't see that coming when we leave. <laughs> uh. um. Actually, why don't, why don't you fill people in on what you've been doing the past 20 years between uh, the film and bud.com? Uh, well, I'm married, and I love my wife, and she came tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm a father, and I was reflecting today that um, I, think, um, I think being a parent is maybe, it's weird because I'm like, I'm looking at myself and the, the loneliness that drove me to seek out friendship and strangers on the internet is like, I'm just so zoomed in on my kid now in a way where I'm like, I feel less alone when I'm able to connect and be a parent. So I think the, the stuff I talked about, all this breastfeeding, you know, my dad, my mom, all this stuff, I'm like, I found my way to create a family. Uh, and it took me a long time and a few abortions and some girlfriends and some marriages and here I am and like, I'm now a father. And what a fucking miracle. And it suffuses me with love and it makes me feel like I have purpose and if my wife and kid got killed, I would be wrecked. And I think about that because, I, you know, impermanence and all this stuff I'm sort of thinking about in the film, like, I'm investing so much in these specific individuals. This was sort of an investment in the human race, right? I'll just put all this shit out there and, and make people, I hope people like me. This is like, I'm going to make sure this, this little girl person thinks I'm cool and keep, keep, <laughs> keep thinking I'm cool. So uh, that's the biggest thing that's happened to me in the last 20 years. They think you're cool until you're, uh, they're about 13. Yeah, or nine or whatever. I, I, uh, the other thing I did was I also made a film reflecting on my life on the web, which is overshare.links.net, which is uh, similar material, just kind of apologizing to the world for the web, my web page. Fair. Okay. I, I, I want to I uh, see if we've got some questions here in the audience. I, I expect we may. Oh, I have a question for the audience. Carl, do you want to say anything? You're so, you're, you're so articulate. Yeah. Come on. Who's, who's got something to talk about? Like, uh, has, has anyone here used the internet? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> John Gold has. <laughs> right back here on your left. Hi, Justin. Um, one of the themes I picked up on in the film was this um, sadness of the web getting commercialized, of this kind of freeform creative platform turning into a a place for capitalism. Um, and I think it was other people in the film, not you necessarily, who were talking about that. I wondered if you could just kind of elaborate on what the sentiment was around San Francisco at that time. Well, I think there was more cheap rent. and Like, all the clothes I'm wearing at the end of the film, I bought at the St. Vincent de Paul at, like, 4th and Folsom because my car got broken into. I was living in, I was sleeping in the Electric Mines office and all my possessions were in a, a rented car and the rented car was stolen. It was tumbleweeds in South Park. It was crazy, uh, you know, in terms of the, the sort of fullness of the city. And so there was just, uh, I think, uh, I don't need to wax poetic about the departed freaks, but the, the um, I mean, it was all an illusion. It was all like de the Defense Department and, and, and colleges put us on the internet. I mean, do, do people love the Defense Department more than they love, you know, more than they hate, uh, you know, Facebook or Google or, you know, Amazon or Apple or whatever? I mean, here we are. We're all just humans, like, trying to sell each other stuff and then and, and, and get off and have fun and be connected. Uh, I mean, I think... Um, the mood at that time, there were a lot of young seekers, you know, if you look at San Francisco, there's a lot of people who still come to the city because where they're from, they don't belong. <coughs> and people don't trust them and people don't treat them right and people don't listen to them and they come here because they can find other freaks and feel less alone. And I still think that's true. There's less room for them. They have to work a lot harder or they live in, you know, Vacaville or Tracy or something and commute. But uh, the, um, the, 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 I don't know, man. I hope that's useful. <laughs> Abby. Abby, you were in the Abby. film. You got anything to say? You want to say something? Well, we were very optimistic. Yeah. We were very, and we believed in what we were doing. But I want to... Hi, I'm Abby, um, friend of Justin's, and Elise and Delia. Anyway, um, 
So you talked about the Library of Alexandria, and you might remember that Brewster Kell has the Internet Archive at archive.org. So Woo! most of your stuff that you took down is actually at archive.org, and so I was just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I think it's, it's um, you know, I've actually, so I've thought about when I die, what do I want to happen to my website? And I, and I was like, oh, do I want to like ask somebody to care about it, to keep patching the server and updating it and stuff? And then I was just like, I'm just going to write a check to Brewster Kale and make a donation to the Internet Archive. Because um, it's what Carl said. Uh, like, w I wrote this web page like 25 years ago. It's no longer accurate. It's not the stories I would choose to tell. It's like, it's incomplete. But I, w I made it, and it's still there, and it sort of might be interesting to someone. So I think I'm very grateful for the work that Brewster does. And it's fascinating that as a human species, we value, uh, we value our collective memory in as much as Brewster Kale is able to run the Internet Archive in a corner of San Francisco. But when you look at the business of what like, the big companies are doing, they're not like remembering very old things. They're like fabricating novelty to entrance us, and 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 we love it. And we scroll endlessly for novelty. And uh, and Brewster Kale sort of beavers away with his two team of renegade librarians, sort of keeping track of the things we might rather forget. And why not? Thank you, Brewster. Hey guys, th uh, thank you. Um, I'm a D Word member, by the way. I'm having trouble logging. No, it, that's not my question. Uh, 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 so as as I get I get older and I look back on, uh, you know, the films and my idealism that I had. You know, I'm sort of jealous for how I felt then. And Justin, I see you. You know, you have a little bit of maybe not regret, but you know, you're maturing and you know you've you've got a different paradigm. Do you? And it, you know, it seemed like you were really, uh, you really valued art, uh, or you know, being an artist when you were in college, and self-expression. Uh, do you feel you've retained any of that, or do you feel like that's harder to hold on to as you get older? So, if you look closely, I, I don't know you very well, and this may never come to pass. But if you come, if you look closely at the photos of me at the birth of my child, you'll see that I have a, a bandage on my face. Uh, because I had, they found a cancerous uh, skin, uh, skin cancer on my face, uh, and I had to have it removed. And it was like time was, got to go, got to do it uh, a week before the kid was born. So I went in and I told them, I said, "Okay, we're gonna do this. Uh, you're gonna do the surgery on my face. I'm gonna be awake, right?" They said, "Yeah, I'm gonna be awake." So I said, "Okay, look, I wanna hold my phone on the video mode, pointed at my face." And they were like, well, we could hold the phone for you. And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> so um, so I, I have a rough cut of like a 23-minute video of me getting this surgery um, where I'm bantering with or talking with the people about skin cancer. And I thought, this would be great. This is an educational video about why you should wear sunblock. And you get to see what a, what a surgery looks like to remove a skin cancer. And, you know, um, it's back to the Tallulah Bankhead thing. It's like I've been so busy doing my life, I haven't had time to figure out who wants to see a 23-minute video of my face surgery? <laughs> and should I edit that some more? And what's the music that should be playing? And what, what channel would I put that on? And so I think, um, and I think about this with regards to my child. You know, the opening frames of homepage are Doug with his daughter. And, he, and you saw the cameras back then. You know that guy's holding his daughter with one hand and about 16 pounds in the other hand, right? Sort of walking across the street with like a camera and a kid and all this stuff. Yeah, so I thought um, when my kid's born, I'm like, I got a document. Oh, my God. And then after a little while, I'm like, oh, my God, my kid is the document. Like everything that's happening is inscribed upon her. And so... What more do I want to say that's not sort of in her being? Um, and then I thought, okay, well, I, again, back to Tallulah Bankhead. Like, do I want to, like, be with my kid? How much time, like, so I shoot, I take fit, photos of my kid, but I don't p really post them anywhere because I just want to take a picture of my kid. I never, I have never told my daughter to smile for a photograph. So I just always try to take a picture of whatever she's doing and put it down as soon as possible so she doesn't even see me with my camera, which is a little creepy, I guess. But, you know, like, I just want to be there and stay there in the moment. 
And then what, what happens to the photos? Who cares? Well, maybe she will. You know, it's this sort of fantasy of like, oh, this is all for, you know, she'll say, wow, my dad was taking pictures of me or whatever. But I hope she doesn't say he wasn't playing with me. Um, and so I'm trying to, I'm living this life of like, my life has never been richer and I, I don't write about it. Well, my, my life was pretty rich, I guess, then, but I don't, I don't write about it. Uh, and I still feel like it's great, but I, don't, I can't remember as much of it. But I don't go back and read that free verse poetry from 1996 about the party with the naked at the college or whatever, you know? Like, um, all this is to say that, you know, part of it is being 20, you know? And I'm 44, and so, like, I just, I'm tired. And I want to, like, you know, <laughs> I want to, like, get angry about Donald Trump and masturbate and go to bed or, what, you know, whatever, I, I, you know, you do in the evenings, you know? Like... <laughs> Like, writing a long poem about something is, like, it's exhausting. It sounds like my life, too. <laughs> and I think we're out of time, but and it was probably a good place to end on. Thanks so much, guys.